Good evening and welcome to the meeting of the Folkestone and Hyde District and Parish Councils Joint Committee. Please note this meeting is being streamed live to the internet. Please could all members ensure their microphone is set to mute unless they are speaking to reduce any background noise. Members should raise hand button when they wish to speak. We go to the first item on the agenda, which is the appointment of chairman. Could I have your nomination, please, for a district's okay. chairman this time? Proposed. Proposed. Nominate Jenny Hodgson. Yes. Seconder for that. I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. I'll hand over to Councillor Hollinsby. Thank, thank you, Kate, and thank you, everybody, and welcome this evening. Um, uh, first item on the agenda. Oh, before I do that, I'd just like to welcome Councillor Wybrow. Don't think she's attended one of these meetings before, so welcome, Councillor Wybrow. Thank you. Um, appointment of chairman we've just done. Apologies for absence. Are there any apologies for absence? No apologies this evening, chairman. Uh, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest that need to be recorded? No. OK, thank you. Minutes of the last meeting. Um, I know probably before I say are they agreed, I know that one or two points that Roger Joyce brought up in that item 16 and 19, 17, the presentations were missing. I'm, I'm sure Kate's dealt with that. Um, the, the presentations are actually shown on the um, website. Um, the, I think what he's referring to is the minutes of the meeting that were attached to this agenda, where we don't attach the presentations. Right. OK, Kate. Thank you very much indeed. I think that clarifies that. And there was a couple of other things I think he asked about in the minutes. Or uh, am I allowed to refer to those? The medical school? Yes, certainly. So, what I've done is I've uh, emailed um, Joyce now and you and just waiting a response on them. So that will uh, be forthcoming. I think I can update because I was involved in that. We do have one, one young lady um, who used to go to Folkestone School for Girls who we are sponsoring as a medical student. I do know her name, but it's not really for publication at this moment. I haven't met her yet. I am due to meet her and have tea at some point. Um, and then the idea is that she will work with the district council. And as soon as she is happy to do that, She's a first year student, so she's quite nervous at the moment, as I understand. So as soon as she's able to do that, I'm sure people will know, will know her or will learn to, to know her. Um, on another student, I think it's highly unlikely at the moment. It's a 25,000 commitment over five years. Um, and um, the council may look at that in the future, but it's not intending to look at it again this year. And it's actually done through the university on a scholarship. They ask us if we are willing to sponsor somebody and it's, it's done th that, through that method. Yes, if you put Kang on that. Yes, um, yes, Terry. Um, yeah, I'm reading that email that you referred to and there was a, a question as to whether, yeah, whether we could sponsor uh, another student and that one, there was talk about a student already studying in London and could he come back? And the answer to that would be no, I guess. You know, you can't just start studying in London and then can I come back to Folkestone or Canterbury to complete? So I, I would agree with you, Jenny, that, um, yeah, not at the moment. Certainly, let's just stick with the one. Thank you for that, um, Terry. But what what would have what would have to happen is it would have to go through the university. So it really would be out of our hands. Yeah. And then there may be another sponsor from another district or from another business from another business. Thank you. And there was a, something else you you rent you um, Roger mentioned the Romney Marsh Action Plan. I didn't know whether we we got a response to that. Not yet, Chairman. Um, I not sure if uh, we could make reference to the uh, Romney Marsh partnership. I believe they're the ones that are bringing that together. Um, but I, I will, I will speak to Chase Ewan on that again. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, right. So with those comments on the minutes, are the minutes, previous minutes agreed? Great. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, then we go on to item five, which is the carbon action plan update. And I don't know who's, who, who's actually going to do that. Is it? Um, yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, yeah I, I was going to um, do a two-hander with um, Olu, uh, my colleague there. Um, so um, my name is uh, Adrian Tofts and I am uh, head up the strategy and policy um, section of the council. So um, that's dealing with um, matters of planning policy, but also um, uh, climate change, which we wanted to um, touch on tonight. So if I can share my screen, um, hopefully um, you can see that screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, what we wanted to do was just to give a brief update of um, some of the projects um, we're working on as a council. Um, sort of broadly under the banner of um, environment and um, climate change, really. So um, there's um, the Carbon Action Plan, which is looking at the council's own emissions and what we do about it. So that's from uh, carbon emissions from our buildings and vehicles and equipment, etc. Um, then we were going to um, go on to talk about Solar Together Kent, which is a countywide project we're involved with. Um, Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, which is a national um, fund that we're putting a bid for. Um, then I'm um, going to do an update on uh, some design topics, so uh, design codes and also um, net zero carbon toolkit, uh, which we just started. Um, going to briefly outline a couple of um, um, evidence-based documents, one on green infrastructure and um, a flood risk assessment, which we just started. Adrian, if I could just interrupt you for a moment, you seem to get in some echo, or is it from somebody yeah, else who's not getting, muted? Getting through, through machines. Through machines. <laughs> Could, could I'm trying to okay. <laughs> Sorry, Adrian. Yeah. Um, and um, then at the end, we were just going to talk about a district wide carbon plan, which is looking beyond the council to the carbon emissions arising from the district as a whole, really. Um, what I propose to do, Chair, if it's um, uh, if people agree, is to sort of pause after each topic um, to uh, to take questions, if if uh, if that's acceptable. <clears throat> so, um, it, it, if that's okay, then I'll I'll hand over to my colleague uh, Olu, who is going to talk about the first topic, the uh, Carbon Action Plan update. Okay, Adrian. Um, so um, the Carbon Action Plan was adopted for the Council's operations and estates in February 2021. It sets out 34 broad actions for us to work towards a net zero in 2030. It focuses on six key areas, including energy, behavioral change, transport, water, contracts, and biodiversity, and a green space. And um, we're just, it's just, it's divided into short, medium, and long-term action plans. And the next couple of slides is, slides is just to highlight the actions, you know, some of them. In the short term, we've trained 193 staffs already. We have a compulsory climate change, e-learning models that people are doing, that staffs are required to do. We did do some training for elected members and some managers, and we've had targeted trainings in terms of report writing and including a climate impact statement as well. Um, we do do our recycling as well within the Civic Center. We've replaced all the beans to be recycled beans with clearly labeled um, signposts, and we're exploring electric vehicles along the way 
a total of 98 electric vehicle charging points will be installed in car parks across the district. Can we go to the next slide, please? So for the medium term, so when we started all this, we had um, a checklist of criteria to help to help address climate in our decision making. So we, the checklist is available on the intranet. Within our reports, we, all our reports that go to the cabinet now, we put a climate impact statement, which is basically to see will it have positive or negative impact based on the, the proposal. Also, we have the new Agile Working Framework, which is in place. This is basically getting people to work where they can, especially because of COVID. But um, they, when they started, they did a review and an estimate of 368 tons of carbon has been saved in 2020-21 due to working remotely. There's also the review of the, the green infrastructure strategy, which you just received from the consultant that will be talked about a bit more details later. Next slide, please. And for the longer term, so we have the strategic risk assessment, which will be talked about as well. Um, KISS Kim, Kent County Council, they're the, giving us a presentation on the spatial risk assessment. And um, we're waiting, we've done the core strategy review, which is a big project, and we're waiting on the inspector's report, which should come into, which we should get anytime soon, if I'm right. And um, applications have been submitted for the design code, which Adrian will talk about in more details later. So we just open for any questions along that, the carbon action plan. Thank you. Are there any questions on the carbon action plan update? No? Okay, thank you. So we can yeah. move Hello. on. Hello. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Mike. Please do. Uh, yeah. Hiya. Uh, yeah, it's just a general question, really following on to the next item on the agenda, and that is I've been looking through the uh, finances and proposals for the next year, and I noticed that one of the things in the earmark reserves is... Uh, climate change, 4,530,000. So will these measures be financed and paid for out of that uh, earmark reserve? It was just a matter of how these were going to be financed. Hey, Adrian, are you able to answer that or? Um, yeah, it will be from a variety of sources. Um, it, s some of those actions um, could be from the climate change reserve, but we would also um, look to see what um, grants or monies we could get from uh, from government a, a, as well on on that. So it, it, it's likely to be from a variety of sources. Okay, that's fine. So I'll, I'll come yeah. back to that item at the next uh, next point in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. No more questions on this section. Then I think we can. Oh, um, can Councillor Thomas. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Um, just a couple of things from me. Um, the first, the climate change e-learning module. Um, is it possible that that could be made available to, to parish councillors? The reason for asking that is that I sit on the Cal Climate Change Committee um, and we've been having discussions with Tom Henderson at KCC um, and Nick Thurston at Canterbury City Council um, about training. Um, so I just wonder if that's... Uh, if there's an opportunity there for us to pick up and, and be at the same level um, as, as our district colleagues, is that possible? I'm not sure who can answer that, um, um, Paul. Um, Adrian, I'm yeah. not sure. And that, that sort of um, what um, uh, Olu referred to is a kind of, it's a fairly high level kind of um, training module that, um, you would need access to a particular portal. But I think what perhaps what we could do is look at putting on some training ourselves. We have made use of the local government information unit to provide more detailed training to officers. And what we might look at after this meeting is to see whether they could do a session for, for others, um, perhaps uh, parish councils. It would probably be more useful, I think. The um, the, the one that um, Olu referred to is um, is sort of it has to cover um, uh, 
quite a lot and it, it, it is quite high level. So um, I, I think perhaps if we took that one away and, and looked at um, if, if there's a, a different way we could provide it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my second point is um, we're also looking for points of contact with um, with the district's uh, councils um, in Kent. So would all you be our point of contact for folks in the High District Council for the future so that um, we, we, we deal with, with one person, it's an awful lot easier doing that. So would all you be the contact for FHDC? Adrian's nodding, so I think that means yeah. yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's great, That's thank you. That's really good, thank you very much. Um, uh, and just on the 94 um, EV charging points, thank you very much for starting with New Romney. Um, so we really appreciate that. And uh, I have to say it's going really well at the moment. So thank you very much. We did have a number of local residents who were, were asking about the vehicle charging points. And uh, the, the only other one we had was in the West Street car park, and it's notoriously unreliable. Um, so it's really good to see that we've got four more available now. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, and then the green infrastructure strategy rollout, what, what can we expect as the next steps for that, um, Olu or Adrian? Um, can I just say, we would actually talk a bit more in depth about the green infrastructure strategy later on, because it's one of the projects we will talk a bit more in depth about. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. That's it from me. Thanks. And I think Roger's got his hand up. Yes, th thanks, Chair. M mine's linked in a way to Paul's point about the 94 charging points. What we understood was they were being installed in council car parks. And for the information of uh, parish councils, uh, can we know where they are? For instance, we, we have a council car park in Liminge, and uh, questions are being asked whether or not we would get one in Liminge. Do we know where they'll be? I think I did put in the news sheet, actually, the Liminge news sheet, that there will be one in, oh, in um, Liminge car park. That. But, but um, I, I stand to be corrected. Yeah. Adrian or um, uh, um yeah it it's being um that that project is being run by by our colleague Fred Miller but we can uh, after the meeting we can see what um what information he can provide and, and circulate it with the minutes so I, I don't know the locations of all of them but uh, fantastic okay thank you uh, okay. can I just say that uh, councillor Hollingsby did put it in the Limings newsletter <laughs> Thank you, Gillian. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it just shows he doesn't read it. I, you know. <laughs> uh, are there any further questions on the carbon action plan? No. Right. Okay. Can we move on to the next se section then, please? Yes. Um, this is uh, Solar Together Kent, which is a project which will um, get going in the next couple of weeks. So. Um, this is a collective buying scheme whereby um, people can express their interest in buying solar panels and battery storage. And then um, from that interest, um, the uh, company negotiates um, discounted prices for installation. Um, the project is being overseen by Kent County Council. And um, we will be rolling it out within the next few weeks. Um, this is round two of the scheme. Round one is nearing completion. And um, despite COVID, I think it's been uh, a successful project. And there's been um, about 2,000 installations across Kent. And um, I think, uh, in general, they've secured um, levels of discount on solar panels of about um, a quarter to a third of the of the price but um, the level of discount um, depends on the amount of interest from people um, so um, it, it's reckoned I think that um, the average solar array on a house would um, save about a ton of, of carbon emissions per household. As I say, round two is about to launch and we will be helping out as a district council with a mail out and um, publicity. Um, people can register their interest through a website and um, I'll, um, we will circulate the slides so you'll have that link there. 
Um, it builds up to um, the auction, which is where the uh, provider negotiates prices. Um, the auction will happen on the 15th of March uh, this year. After the auction, the, the company gets back to people who've expressed an interest and gives them a quote. And they can then decide at that point if they want to go forward or not. And following that, um, uh, people will go out and do surveys of the houses to make sure they're suitable. And um, from that, um, installations would be rolled out and the um, anticipated data completion would be the end of October this year. So it's just one to kind of look out for. And um, if, uh, if parish and town councils are willing, we could provide um, posters or publicity that could be put up on uh, parish notice boards. Um, so um, perhaps if I pause there for, for any questions on, on that. All right. Is there any questions on the Silo Together, Kent? Roger? I have one. Does it cover new builds as well, Adrian? Um, no, th this is sort of principally aimed at um, existing homeowners. So okay. um, and anybody who is in the house and is the um, owner of the house or the freeholder can uh, can apply. But uh, yeah. No. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Any further questions? Oh, Paul? Uh, yeah, thank you, Jenny. Um, would would this apply to um, parish council properties? I mean, if we if we wanted to tie into this in some way, would we be able to do that and benefit from this kind of scheme? Uh, do you know, Adrian? Um, um, unfortunately, it's um, it's targeted at homeowners. I can I can get back to the company and see if there is another scheme that could be used for community building. But um, this particular project is aimed at um, homeowners. Uh, thank you. No further questions on solar yeah. together. Uh, together. Oh, yeah, sorry. Please. Sorry, Mike. Um, yeah, actually, it's probably an answer with Paul there. We uh, actually bought a new uh, village hall annex that we built with a 12 kilowatt uh, array on the roof. But unfortunately, um, it's too small to get any commercial work. Uh, sale but we don't fall under the domestic um umbrella so is there any way we could negotiate some sort of battery scheme or something like that so effectively we're producing quite a lot of electricity but we're we're not actually getting any payback for it because we fall between the two schemes we're neither domestic or large commercial so any advice would be gratefully received yeah um Again, I think this, this, this project is aimed at domestic schemes, but I, I can take that away and I can ask the, the um, Kent County Council and, and the company that is running it and see um, if there is anything for, for battery uh, storage for, for non-domestic uh, properties that they could help with. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, we've had no luck with that at all. So any advice will be useful. Thank you. Thank you. Any any further questions on the solar together, Kent? No? Okay, thank you. Can we move on to the next se section, please, then, Adrian? Yeah, sure. I'm uh, going to hand over back to uh, Olu now, I think it is, and, and she, she is going to talk about um, the, the bid we've put in to decarbonise our social housing. Thank you. Adrian, so we've put together a bit for the social housing decarbonization fund. Um, it's currently being submitted and it was approved before, prior to submission, it was approved by a corporate leadership team. The purpose of the fund is basically to raise the least efficient social housing to the EPC rating so that there is a minimum standard of a C, EPC C rating for all those buildings. We're particularly targeting 190, 109 homes with Ross House included and because in the council is a landlord. This is offering a fund of 1.9 million pounds for the council, but we'll, the council as a well whole will need to provide 0 0.9 of it. This is the first wave of it, which we've applied for and wave two is expected. 
Well, I think for what I can highlight in this is that it's helped us to put some sort of cost things in place. So should in case we're hoping that we would get in with the wave one, but if we don't, then we've already done the background work, which will make us, you know, ready to be able to apply for the wave two. Because when it comes to funding, you have to have had some cost things in place already, which we have done already. So um, they did say that we would hear back the outcome probably in February this year. So anytime soon, we should be able to hear whether we're successful for the wave one of this. And it will really help with our housing, social housing work. Thank you. Hi. Pass are, pass pass. Thank you very much. Are there any other are, are there any questions on the social social housing decarbonisation? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Then. I can't. And we What's move on to the rest of them. Sorry. Uh, what's happening about the rest of the social housing and what sort of upgrade are you doing for them? Ali, are you able to answer that, please? Yes. Um, the thing is, so we have identified the social housing. We've actually just done a stock condition survey to check all the housing that we have. So this one and I are the least energy efficient ones that we're targeting for now. We've put together a lot of you know, preparation into funding bids because most of these projects are large scale projects. So we're prepared to be able to apply for bids as they come up, um, you know, funds as they come up. But right now we're targeting, we, the, we have list of different scales of the housing based on our housing condition. So we're going to be targeting them, but we're focusing on the first 109 list efficient ones to start with because most of the I think based on um, Adrian correct me if I'm wrong but based on the housing conditions survey we do have a good number of our stock which is within you know the minimum rating of EPCC. You do have a good number of I didn't hear the last sentence. That we do have a good number of our housing which are within that range of EPCC which is the minimum if energy efficient rating we're trying to look at. So what we're trying to focus now is the least energy efficient ones, which are the 109 buildings. We'll first of all, push that up to EPCC. We're still looking for funding. So when we do get funding, we'll roll it out. So it's kind of like they've been grouped into categories. Right. And will you get enough funding to do all your existing council housing to get it up to band C? I can't answer that question because I don't know. We are applying for funds. At the end of the day, if we are successful, we will get the funds. But, you know, we are definitely, we've put together um, a system in place whereby we're already prepared when those funds come available so that we can put in bids for the funds. Thank you, Alu. Thank you. Uh, any other questions before, before we, oh, Leslie, you wanted to say something. Yes, I just wanted to say, really, uh, I think it's recognised that if we are going to upgrade all our houses to net zero carbon, we are going to need quite a bit from government. And see that, you know, we'll have to wait and see whether that comes forward. But the, the I think the requirement is that we get all the council houses up to EPCC by 2030 and all of them to net carbon zero by 2050. But, you know, countrywide, that is a huge challenge. Um, and we there is a on the cabinet agenda for next week, there is a housing um, asset management strategy and it does actually refer to using technology that doesn't exist yet. so you know we are facing a huge challenge but the, the important thing is that it will also help with fuel poverty which especially at the moment is so it's, it's definitely very high up our list of priorities and um, when we are looking at the base carbon emissions of the council and um, one of our biggest emissions comes from some of the sheltered housing blocks which are communally heated so, yeah, we, you know, we, there are lots of challenges, but we do recognise them in it, yeah, and we are looking for the funding. Thank you, Leslie. I think we're now on to design codes and planning reforms. Uh, yes, um, I think we've, we've been uh, to, to this forum previously with, with this item, really. It's just a, a quick update. Um, the, the government, as, as you may know, um, uh, proposed uh, quite sweeping reforms to the planning system through its white paper. Part of that was that all local authorities should create new design codes. And the idea was this would greatly speed up decisions on planning applications. 
Um, we put in uh, September last year to be a pilot for design codes. Um, we haven't heard back from government whether we were successful or not, and there's been nothing since from government on, on the planning reforms, really. But um, it is one to uh, which we will co come back to you with if we do hear. I, th I think a key question, you know, in terms of the topics we've been discussing tonight is how much design codes will um, deal with um, energy efficiency and um, sustainability. Uh, and it's something we wanted to explore through becoming a design code pilot, but um, uh, it, it's, it's one to, to um, keep an eye out for really. Um, that said, um, in the absence of, of the um, kind of indication from government, we, we are pressing ahead with um, creating uh, a net zero carbon toolkit. Um, this is drawing on work that's been done by West Oxfordshire Council and um, uh, a couple of uh, councils in the Cotswolds area that was published uh, uh, late last year. Uh, we've recently appointed um, some consultants and the Passive House Trust to help us out with this. And what we'll be doing is we will be creating um, what will hopefully be a, a practical and easy to follow guide that would be directed at um, small and, and medium house building companies, but also at homeowners and it will hopefully sort of demystify how we can create more energy efficient and sustainable houses and also how homeowners can um, put in place their own um, retrofitting um, technologies. Uh, and we, we wanted to look at the whole process from um, sort of pre-planning right through to installation and maintenance. And um, as I say, hopefully it will um, demystify uh, some of this area, which uh, I know can be very um, technical and um, quite uh, confusing. So uh, again, on the slides, we've got a link there to the work that West Oxfordshire did, and um, we will be using that and um, creating something um, uh, to, to address the uh, particular circumstances of um, Folkestone and Hive. So um, I don't know if anybody's got any uh, questions about those, um, those two items. I think Paul has. Uh, Paul's had his hand up. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, Paul, thank, thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, again, at, at the Calc AGM, um, we had a presentation from Rachel Cox Coon. Um, and um, she's very much engaged with what was going on in Oxfordshire and Cotswolds with the local authorities and talked to us about um, things like um, the impact tool that are being used in those authorities um, and um, also about the carbon literacy project that sort of goes with that. Um, my question really is, um, how, how is the Folks and High District Council Planning Committee being briefed with regard to these? And in terms of uh, a pilot, would, would they be averse to comments from parish councils on um, individual planning applications where we could be seen to be leading the field, where we're actually you know, more demanding of um, developers to include some of the things that you're proposing as part of the pilot to do with um, you know, um, electrical vehicle charging points? I think a lot of developers are already in tune uh, with regard to, you know, the insulation of houses and the standards associated with that. But I just wondered if the planning committee would accept comments in terms of, you know, trying to raise the bar um, and, and get ahead of the field, Adrian, to be honest with you. That's my, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you for that, Paul. Uh, you got a comment, Adrian? Uh, yes, uh, I will... Um need to defer to um, Llewellyn Lloyd on the planning committee and this piece of work I think could could hopefully um, kick start something with um, with house builders and homeowners but in terms of the default position of what we can and can't require that's kind of set through the local plan by planning policy 
that that said, it can it could well be that that is um, soon replaced by design codes, and um, hopefully through design codes we can um, we can um, raise the bar a bit in terms of uh, what people are required to um, to uh, submit along with their uh, planning applications. Yeah, you, you did brief us previously on, on the design code change, and that's something, that's a dialogue that we've had um, with, with you in the past. I'm just looking at, you know, how, how can we, I know it's not enforceable, but I'm just thinking about, you know, best practice and how can we get ahead of the pack really and say, you know, you know can we make comments in relation to this particular developer is doing it this way and is providing this, and yet a development across the road, and they're applying slightly different standards, um, and maybe cost saving a little bit more and not applying the same number of vehicle charging points as a percentage of the overall development. And, and that's a very real issue for us. I can tell you, Adrian, it, with relation to two developments that are going either side of Ashford Road in your Romney. So that, that's my point, really. I, I have to say, I totally understand what you're saying. But as we're always told at playing and being a member of the planning committee for a long, for a number of years, <laughs> That each application has to be judged on its own merits, and uh, and of course, I, I mean the plan, planning members do certainly talk about um, possible things that builders could do or developers could do. But as Adrian says, we cannot enforce that, and I think it is something we need to take back to Llewellyn. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you for ra thank you yeah. for raising it. No, thank thank you for that, Jenny. Um, my point is, any of these applications have pre-application advice provided by the district council officers. And so I'm just wondering whether it's part of that pre-application advice, they could be more forceful in terms of what they ask developers to do, Jenny. That's my point. Thank you. <laughs> thank, for, thank, you. thank you, Paul. <laughs> right, I think um, now's the time to move on if there's no further questions on this section. Adrian, um, is that? Yes. Um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll move on and... Um, hand back to Olu, who, who um, is going to talk about the green infrastructure strategies. Thank you. The green infrastructure strategy, so we it's basically an update on the 2011 green infrastructure plan. So we commissioned consultants to do the work. They have given us back the report, a very comprehensive report. Prior to that, we had workshops and meetings to explore green, blue, infrastructure, when we talk about green infrastructures, ranging from SODs to, you know, just making things a bit more, a bit more efficient, basically. And um, we had stakeholder meetings um, with, uh, we had stakeholder meetings, local council elected members, all this was done last year prior to us calling the consultants and, um, and giving it out to the consultants to do. It basically assesses five evidence areas, which has a climate change theme cutting across it. The next step for this is that we're going to have, we have strategic priorities and opportunities from it, which we'll, which we'll use to produce an action plan containing more specific projects going forward. So I haven't seen that because right now it's um, it is one of our colleagues that was leading on this project. And right now she's reviewing it kind of like so that we can pieces and, and um, understand it and know how to take that forward. But the next step is to basically develop more detailed action plan based on the recommendations that was from that green infrastructure strategy. And Adrian, do you want to go with the Lord risk? Thank you. Well, uh, sorry, I'll go back. Can I just show my ignorance and ask what the, it's gone now? The bit about the blue strategy. I know what green means. I don't know what blue means at the moment. I think it's water. Is it water? Uh, yes, it's it's looking at um, the sort of ways that water can connect nature. So you know whether it's rivers or canals. Yes, or, about the style or, uh, problem. Ponds and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, so I think we can move on now. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, 
following on from that, um, another piece of evidence we've begun to update is the uh, strategic flood risk assessment. So um, we've got one uh, published um, in 2015 uh, that looks at the whole district and the risks of flooding across the district. Um, Things have moved on. Obviously, there are new um, predictions about the impacts of climate change. And also, in the meantime, there has been um, uh, new uh, flood defences provided. So we've recently commissioned uh, consultants uh, to update this study for us and um, look at it and produce new modelling. Um, the updated study is going to look at flood risk from all forms of flooding. So that is uh, flooding from rivers, uh, flooding from the sea if, uh, if sea defences are breached, um, overland flooding, um, uh, flooding from sewers and, and reservoirs, etc. And um, it will take into account the, the latest predictions on uh, the, the effects of climate change on uh, rising sea levels, etc. Um, what it will do is it will um, uh, provide uh, detailed uh, information about the risks of flooding across the district and uh, which areas are at high risk, which are at medium and which are at low risk. And then from that, we can uh, use it in the planning process. So, you know, whether we are deciding planning applications in a particular place or the um, amount of information we require planning applicants to submit along with their applications. We will also use it for the uh, up, updating the local plan. And um, it's also used for sort of emergency planning and, and flood mitigation works. Um, we're due to hold the inception meeting with the consultants in a week or so. So it's at very early stages, but um, when we get some results and we start to, uh, you know, get a draft um, study, then uh, we can bring it back to this forum and um, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know what uh, what is emerging from that. So I, I don't know if anybody has any uh, questions at that point. Uh, any questions? No, thank you very much. Okay, can we move on? Uh, yes, and um, at this point, I hand it back uh, to, to Olu to talk about the district-wide plans. Thank, thank you. Olu? We have also, been working, we have also been working on the district-wide carbon plan. So we've taken a proposed structure, an engagement proposal, project plan, and a proposal for the project timeline, which has been approved at CLT and the working group. It's focusing on the five priority areas, which are where you know the greatest emissions are, so, which is the road transport, residential buildings, commercial and industrial buildings and processes, other activities, and the land use absorption. We are part of a district. We can't, and you know, as a council, we're part of a district. We can't do it alone. So the idea is that the council would act as an influencer of change, supporting local communities, key partners, businesses, public so that we can implement measures, targeted measures to help reduce emissions and adapt to climate change, um, taking in cons into consideration our local system circumstances, our future aspiration, so that together we're all working towards, you know, this net zero together. And um, so that's currently in the process. And um, I think the next stage now is to take it to cabinet, but it's in the process we're working on it now. Thank you. Hello. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Paul? Yeah, just, just one if I may. Um, Ollie, if I may, um, is this using the impact tool for looking at territorial footprint and consumption footprint? Is, is that what this is proposed to do? Um, if I can answer that and each one you can add to it. So what we've done is there's been a bit of background. We got information from the scatter I think scatter cities about the district wide emissions. So, based on that, where is a small proportion of the emissions? And it's 
it's mostly more like encouraging working and finding out what's because I do know there are things currently going on within the district. So we need to know what is, we would engage widely with people, know what is going on within the district and we can map out what steps needs to be done. So in terms of that, we don't have the total picture right now, we're just the council. So this is why we've put together this proposal to first of all, understand what is on ground and understand where we can you know, collaborate together and be able to work towards a net zero. Okay, um, because again, if I may, Olga, thank you for that. Um, at Calc, we've actually produced um, a carbon footprint calculator for parish and town councils, uh, which is <laughs> gonna be rolled out through the area committees across Kent. Um, and again, I think it would dovetail very nicely into um, what, what is being proposed at district level. So again, I'll make sure you're included in the um, in any communications associated with that. Thank you very much. Very much, and that will be very useful. As I said, until we we actually talk to people, we, we don't have a full picture of what is going on. So thank you for mentioning that. And yes, I'll wait to hear from you. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. Frank, you've got a question. Excuse me just a moment. I've got to open the... Some... <coughs> That's not a question. As a, as a comment, um, at what stage will the district be um, bringing the town and parish councils within the, within the area into the discussions? Um, so we have, as we have done a proposal for consultation, we have stages of consultation we're going to do. And um, what we're proposing actually is to form something called the Carbon Innovation Lab, where we would have key you know, representatives, stakeholder representatives, because the idea is we're not going to, we can't do it alone. So it's kind of like we're going to drop, start with high level actions and basically narrow down based on input from everybody. And, you know, Parish Council, Parish Council is one of the stakeholder consultees that we have written down already. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? No, thank you very much. Adrian, are we? Um, how, are, yeah, and how are we doing? Um, <laughs> lastly, and uh, quickly, th this is related to the, the um, uh, topic that Olly has just been speaking about, the district-wide plan. As she says, we, we realise that this is quite a new plan for the council in that um, we, we have limited powers to enforce anything in terms of um, reducing carbon emissions district wide. So um, we will have to um, engage with people early on and um, hopefully build up a consensus and um, some momentum for, for us to, uh, to uh, move forward. Uh, as part of that, we've put in a bid to the UK 100 uh, network of local authorities um, for help with um, public engagement. Um, UK 100 is, is, is a group of local authorities from across the country, uh, metropolitan authorities and rural authorities. And I think there, there, there's a lot of expertise there which we can draw on and um, engage, um, use it to engage with local people right the way along the process from first drawing up the carbon plan to um, implementing it at the end. So uh, that's the last uh, that's the last we have on this topic. So uh, thank you. Right, thank you very much indeed. Are there any questions at all to Adrian or Olu? Uh, well, I'd just like to thank you both very much indeed for giving up your time this evening. Um, very interesting presentation. Thank you very much indeed. And of course, you're welcome to stay, but you can get, you can leave us if um, if you would prefer. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And I think we now move on um, to the the budget strategy, um, and I think Charlotte will be talking us through through the strategy. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Charlotte Spendley. I'm the Director of Corporate Services here at Folkestone and Hythe. Um, so the paper that's in front of you covers, um, in summary, the budget strategy and the draft general fund budget for the forthcoming year. At the council, um, we spent quite a lot of time preparing the budget. So the process starts um, in the very late part of the summer, um, where we look at the medium term financial strategy. 
So that strategy sets out our financial position running from the year that's coming up, 22, 23, right through to 25, 26. And when we undertook that assessment, we identified that we anticipated a budget gap for the coming financial year of 1.6 million pounds. Um, we take that forward and um, that's the work of the budget strategy. And during the budget strategy process, we ask our budget managers across all services um, to look for um, possible savings that they can make from their service um, and also identify growth that's necessary. We'll undertake a review of all fees and charges for the council at the same time. Um, and we'll build all of those factors and any other known factors that have come to um, light during that process into the budget strategy position, which um, cabinet this year considered in December. And at that stage, we were around about the million pound gap. We've just tabled um, on Tuesday, to the Finance and Performance Subcommittee, a draft detailed budget. And the summary of that is in your paper at 3.3. So there are still some unknowns and it's still very much a draft position until we go forward to full council in February. And the unknowns in the budget we touch on in 1.2 in your paper. Um, but what we have had is the draft local government finance settlement. Um, which was announced during December. And we have built that picture into the general fund summary that's um, in front of you. So in summary, we are anticipating at the moment to have a budget gap next financial year of around 1.1 million. Um, we haven't taken decisions yet on um, how we'll close that gap, but given that um, the members don't wish to have any cuts to services and given that we've already undertaken the growth and savings exercise it's very likely that we'll need to utilize some reserves in order to close that budget gap in February in order to protect frontline services. Um, as I've touched on in the report we um, are undertaking a budget consultation exercise at the moment and I'll, I'll refer a bit mo more to that in a moment because I have been asked some questions about the budget consultation exercise. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, our budget process results in the setting of the council tax. Full council will consider that on the 23rd of February this year when we'll build in everything we understand about the forthcoming financial year. Um, I have had a number of questions tabled before the meeting. So it's my intention just to run through um, the answers to those questions because they may be helpful to all committee members um, by way of explanation. So the first question um, that was asked was about how the council's engaging with stakeholders and local residents, the consultation that we're referring to in the paper. So um, you, you may have seen some of this yourself um, through different channels. We launched a public consultation exercise through our website um, in December. Um, and that uh, exercise is on our website and it includes all of the relevant budget documents I've just referred to there. So the medium term financial strategy, the budget strategy, the fees and charges, the growth and savings, they're all available on the consultation page. Um, that consultation exercise has been promoted through our own website. It was on the homepage for the first two weeks. Um, there was a press release that went out on the 23rd of December, which is, of course, shared with our own district councillors, but should have come to town and parish councils also. Um, and of course, we've been using social media, both when we launched it and again this week. Um, it will go out again on social media next week to try and encourage participation. In addition, um, 100 posters promoting the consultation have been placed at key sites um, around the district, including community hubs and sports facilities that have been sent to residence groups, community groups, etc. Um, emails have gone out to business leaders um, through the Business Advisory Board and a new initiative that was suggested to us this year by our own members, our scrutiny committee, was that one of the reasons we have low uptake in the consultation exercise is that 
many residents don't understand what council tax is and why they're paying for it and what it services. Um, so we've developed a short video. It's just two minutes long. It's available on our YouTube channel. Um, and it just explains what council tax is in a, you know, a very quick way. There'll be a second video, which we hope to launch um, next week, which will cover how to pay your council tax. And indeed, if you're having trouble paying your council tax, how we might be able to help you in that regard. Um, the second question I was asked was about um, whether there's a possibility of focus groups or local public meetings with regards to um, the budget consultation. Um, we have got, as I'm sure you appreciate, limited resources available. So we would encourage people to participate in the questionnaire, um, which is live. We haven't got any plans currently um, for focus groups or public meetings. Um, but what I would say is that the budget at various stages is considered both at our overview and scrutiny committee and the finance and performance subcommittee and cabinet before being tabled to full council. So if interested parties are not able to or not keen to provide their feedback to uh, through the questionnaire facility, then of course they could feedback to their relevant elected councillor um, who can bring that feedback back to uh, the relevant committee. Um, I've been asked to, to explain what the collection fund is uh, and the finance settlements. So starting with the collection fund, um, Folkestone and Hythe um, is what's known as a billing authority. And what that means really is that we're responsible for billing and collecting relevant council tax and business rates within the district. So billing authorities, because of that, have a statutory obligation to maintain a separate account to record those transactions. And that's what's known as the collection fund. Um, so those balances relate to the collection of those taxes from the taxpayers and the distribution to the local authorities and the government for uh, council tax and um, business rates. The finance settlement is an announcement that's made by the relevant government department responsible for local government at that point in time. That obviously changes <laughs> at the moment. That's the department um, of levelling up housing and communities. And annually, they announce the funding to be made available to local authorities such as ourselves and guidance on other funding, such as the levels that councils can raise their council tax by without the need for a referendum. Um, the next question that was asked is in relation to 1.3 in the report where we talk about unavoidable budget growth. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for the budget strategy exercise, we ask our managers to identify relevant savings um, from their base budget, but also any relevant growth. Um, so those items come forward through that process. Unavoidable growth is normally driven either by operational pressures or IT system improvements, policy changes, or at times legislative changes, which require us to change our budget. Um, if you were interested in the full list of growth and savings, then it is in the budget strategy paper, um, the cabinet budget strategy paper, but I can also get a, sent, a link sent with the um, minutes to the committee. Um, the next question refers to section 2.3 um, and the implications for there being no referendum limits. So in 2.3, where I refer to no referendum limits, I am referring to town and parish councils, not the district council itself. Um, so what that means is that town and parish councils are free to set their council tax precept request at any level they feel appropriate for the parish um, and that there's no public referendum required by the government, regardless of the resulting percentage increase um, in the, the band D dwelling for council tax, which is just the standard council tax that most measures are taken from. Um, but that does just apply to town and parish councils. As I've said in the paper, there is a limit set for district councils like ourselves. Um, I've been asked if new homes bonus applies to new dwellings as well as conversions and change of use. And yes, it, 
it does new homes bonus covers new build conversions and long-term empty homes brought back into use um, the lower tier services grant that I refer to in the paper is a new grant. It was new last year. Well, the current financial year. Um, it's a new grant provided by the government to lower tier authorities. So lower tier authorities are like Folkestone and Hive, where there's an upper tier authority like Kent County Council. It's an unring fence grant. So all that means is we don't have to use it for any designated specific service or purpose. Um, and it was introduced by the government um, so that they could ensure that no council had less funding available to it than a previous year. That funding is determined by a very complicated government mechanism, um, but it, that's the principle of that grant. Um, there are also questions tabled about planning. So why the expenditure noted in the table in the summary is so low. And if we make any special provision for conservation services, conservation areas, um, designation, appraisals, creation of local lists or neighborhood planning. So all of the budgets, but including the planning budget in the service areas, they're all net budgets. So what that means is Thereafter, we take into account the income for that service area. So obviously planning is an area where the council generates quite a significant income. And therefore that number in the table is after we've offset the 1.39 million pounds worth of planning income that the council receives or anticipates to receive next year. There isn't a specific budget provision for the other items um, asked about. However, there is a professional advice budget uh, within the planning budget, which is utilised to seek relevant advice on heritage matters. Um, and the planning policy team have a um, small budget available to address sort of wider policy issues of those subjects. In terms of neighbourhood planning specifically, the council um, worked not that long ago with St Mary's in the Marsh on their neighbourhood plan. So there is a government scheme where the council can reclaim the funds from the government for neighbourhood plans, but we do need to reach certain milestones in order to do so. Um, so it would depend upon whether or not we've reached those milestones, whether we could make that claim back. Um, I've also been asked about the forecast position. So yes, just to clarify, that bottom line number of 1.114 million is a forecast deficit position. So we'll need to find the funds to close that gap. The general reserve um, is the council's unearmarked reserve. So it's a reserve we can use, but it's not set aside for a specific purpose or a specific service. Um, that reserve is the result of events that have allowed monies to be set aside. So that might be where we made a surplus that we hadn't anticipated, or we spent less, or expenditure was deferred, or postponed, or cancelled. Um, the council's reserve policy requires us to hold at least 1.5 million by way of a general reserve. So as you'll see by the deficit position and the amount we're holding in the general reserve, even if we were to draw everything we need for next year from the general reserve, we would still be above uh, the position that we need to be in. Um, the next few questions are about the reserves themselves. Um, so there's a earmarked reserve noted in um, section 4.2 of the paper, um, which is about community led housing. So that's an earmarked reserve. Earmarked reserves are where we do designate them for a specific purpose. And this particular one is for the community led housing project. So that's a ongoing project um, where we work with local groups within the community to help them provide affordable homes to meet their identified housing needs. So it's a project that's still in its pretty early stages. Um, we're actively working with three groups at the moment, I understand. The most advanced group being from the Nepalese community mm -hmm. in Cheriton. And that group are in the process at the moment of identifying, um, completing their housing needs assessment. So this project 
provides um, funding for an officer within the council um, to assist groups with their local needs assessments, the identification of sites. It can also provide potential funding for them to establish themselves as a proper entity to take forward their initiative. It can help them um, work, work, can work with them to help secure potential funding from Homes England and um, obviously does some signposting to other relevant bodies. I mean, a bit that you might be interested in there is that the groups can be community-based like the one I just referred to, um, but they can also be led by a parish council looking to develop um, local needs housing. So that may be of interest. Um, the second earmark reserve that I've had a question about is homelessness prevention. Um, so that's a earmark reserve from a government grant so that's a government grant where we've had it and we have to use it for a specific purpose. And in this case, it's homelessness prevention. So we're utilizing that for additional targeted staffing to prevent homelessness and some associated third sector funding as well. Um, I was asked with regards to 5.1 in the report if I would be addressing the town and parish precepts and them remaining subject to confirmation at the meeting today. I can't address that specifically. Um, the deadline for precept submissions isn't till the end of the month. So um, we don't yet have all the precepts. So I can't confirm what the total precept sum will be. We have got a lot um, through already, but um, preceptors have still got a bit longer to make their submissions if they want to. Um, I hope those um, notes were useful. I can provide... Um, them in writing if that's also helpful. Um, I'm happy to take any quest other questions there might be, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Charlotte, for that very detailed um, um, presentation of, of the budget strategy. Very much appreciated. Um, are there any questions? I think a lot of the questions actually have been answered, but perhaps there are some more questions. I like. Oh, Frank, was did you? Was it? I thought I heard Frank. No? No, it's me, Mike. <coughs> oh, Mike, sorry. A um, couple of points. Um, just as a general query, really, um, obviously we get quite a lot of government funding. What is the lag between the promised funding and our actually receiving the funding? And do we have to put something in the reserve to cover that lag? Yeah, um, does really depend on the grant, to be honest. Um, normally we do get the funding quite quickly. I mean, during COVID, it's been a bit different because often there have been announcements made about, particularly about grants that we passport on, where the announcement's made very, you know, very early and we haven't got the guidance or the funding for some time. I, I wouldn't say there's a significant delay. I mean, we normally have funding within a month or two of the announcement being made and the council has sufficient cash flows that generally speaking, we can you know, as long as we've had the announcement and the confirmed schedule of funding, you know, if we if we need to move the money quickly, then we can do. Uh, secondly, is there anything within the climate change reserve, which I see is four and a half million, that uh, parish councils might be interested in? I.e., if we've got any climate change initiatives, is there anything within that budget that we could look at using for our initiatives? Yeah, um, I mean, Councillor Wybrow might wish to add, um, but there's nothing. So the allocations that have currently been made from that reserve are for resourcing, for the LED lights project and for a small amount of funding that we've utilised for the charging points. Um, although the majority of the funding for that scheme came from grant. Um, the remainder isn't earmarked, although it's earmarked for the purposes of climate change, it's not earmarked to a specific project yet. Um, so the council would need to take, you know, a specific decision on a project that it wants to progress. So there's nothing in there at the moment that would be relevant to parish council. Um, I'll, I'll just see if Councillor Wybra wanted to add anything further to that point. Yes, I wouldn't view it as a fund that you could apply for as such. It is definitely for the district council's own expenditure. But having said that, we are looking at this district wide project and part of that project will be 
you know, to encourage people and to sign posts to apply for other funding. So, yeah, I mean, we're quite keen on Limp and a Green Network. We're doing our own plan to try and promote that. So, obviously, yeah, it is a district wide thing we, we'd like to link into. So, that's one thing. And then a final point uh, the Limp preset was set as unchanged this year. So, let's just pat us on the back a little bit there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, right, any other questions for Charlotte? Paul? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, what, one of the things you talked about was um, uh, the second video, you know, how to pay council tax. Um, one of the things that was pushed um, an awful lot a little while ago was the use of my account to make sure that people understood exactly, you know, where they could go and understand how their how their council tax is constructed. Do you know what percentage uh, of of homeowners have actually um, taken up my account? Um, as a means of gaining, of, of accessing that information? Um, I think before Christmas, we reached the high 40%, mm. but don't hold me to that. I, I will get a firm number for you and um, ask Kate to pass it along. But I think just before Christmas, it was the high 40s. I think so it was someone... above, above target, I think, actually. It was above yeah. target. Okay. Yes. Right. So again, um, when when we were briefed on this a little while ago, um, and it was going to be a review of you know how successful it was in the various stages of rolling my account out within that second video, you're going to be pushing that as well because again, I, I I'll be honest with you, I find it a very useful service, and you know I can't imagine why anyone who's got reasonable internet access would not actually use the, the thing to be perfectly honest with you not just for council tax for everything else you can do through there so you know, there's a real benefit and I just wonder if if the message is out there I mean we've tried to push it you know down a parish level but I, I'm not sure you know whether it needs another concerted effort from district to to get the information out there that's all that's yeah the, no it's a really really good point I'm just trying to cast my mind back because we wrote the script just before Christmas uh, uh, and that feels a while ago now. If it's not in there, I will ask for it to be put in before we conclude the video because it is it's a very good point. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. Very, very much, very, well, very informative. Um, and I think, if I'm right, that concludes our meeting. Yeah. You have Councillor uh, Council Mullard. Mullard. Oh, sorry, I do apologise. Terry, it's because you're a bit... Um, oh, a bit faint. A bit foggy, a bit foggy. <laughs> um, it's just a couple of little points um, on, on the general reserve. Uh, notice of the, your reserve, our reserve has gone down £9 million over the year. Um, from 27 to 18. Um, obviously, some of that is because of this huge COVID, COVID recovery amount in, in of six and a half million compared to 300,000. Um, but looking at it, it just in the pounds um, earmark reserve less. Um, I just want confirmation that that's what, what it means. And do I understand it right? Um, yeah, yes, you're, you're correct, um, Councillor Mullard. So um, the, re the reserves, particularly the earmark reserves, um, do move on a downward trend um, between the beginning of 21 and the forecast balance um, in 22. So... The COVID recovery reserve is a major reason for that. That in part is to do with business rates um, and um, funding from the government um, for, uh, for COVID, um, which we've had to move between years, which is why it's in that earmark reserve and all utilised um, or largely all utilised um, during the current financial year. There are a few other significant draws upon the reserve. Um, so, um, as you know, um, Mountfield Road has progressed significantly in year, so that's quite a large draw on reserve. And there are some other small um, draws on reserve, but as you say, um, the most significant mm. is the COVID recovery. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, thank you. 
Does that answer your question, Terry? I think so, yes. Right. Are there no other questions? Well, I, I thank you all very much indeed for attending. Um, and I therefore declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much indeed.